Today's topic is in um, keeping with uh, Pride Month, Gay Pride Month for the LGBT community, but also in the larger perspective of diversity and um, you know, George Floyd and the protests, you know, what's happening all over the country. And I, I loved addressing this issue because the, this industry is an interesting issue, uh, diversity. Our industry is not one of the most diverse industries. I'm talking about financial services. Um, there have been all sorts of surveys done and it tends to be predominantly male, predominantly white, and uh, certainly um, older than average. Uh, and one thing I, um, I can share is that after the election between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, the Financial Services Institute, which is our lobbying arm in Washington, in fact, that's part for us at Satir Advisors, to choose to join that is part of our renewal, that this organization's right on our renewal form if we choose to, it's optional to renew and um, be a part of that organization. They did a, a poll of 1,300 financial advisors, found that 71% voted for Trump and only 19% voted for Hillary Clinton. So that doesn't exactly mirror the, the population at large. 71% versus 19%. So when you know, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by 2%. So this is where I say our industry tends to be less diverse and also much more conservative. And that affects, I think, uh, and I've been asked to talk on this many times, our relationships with our clients. And I, I really want to say, you know, I'm an openly gay man. My husband is Hispanic from Argentina. Uh, our office is very diverse. We have people uh, from all over the world, all different backgrounds. We've had um, interns here from Russia, from China, you know, you know, you know, people, our clients, I think if I went through our list of clients, we probably have people from over 20 different countries. We have um, you know, Jewish, Muslim, um, you know, just all sorts of different backgrounds. The, I mean, the diversity is incredible and it's, it's wonderful. I, in fact, I remember one great moment at the, our annual holiday party that we, we've done for the past several years at our house one older gentleman, he was in his 90s, I was making my very quick speech and he asked to speak. He was the only other person who spoke and he was right next to me. And he grabbed the microphone and he said, look at this crowd of our clients and their guests. And he said, this is Miami. This is what it's all about. Look at you all. And there's just all this positive energy, all this diversity. And we even now have themes as we do these parties of different countries. So we did India last year. We have Harshita Kalra here is from India and we have clients from India. So um, we'll see, hopefully we can get back to doing this again after the coronavirus, uh, or we'll do it where we're all in masks or something, it's, but it's a, a fun tradition that we've had. But I wanna stress how I see the importance of diversity and dignity and all of these issues. You know, we are fiduciaries, which that means we have a duty to you of, of obviously in loyalty, of no conflicts of interest, of utmost care. And I think part of that is clearly one of the foundations of this industry has to be honesty and integrity, that you trust us and that you have a high comfort level. And you know, if you feel that you are on the outside, that you might be a minority like me, who is working with somebody in this industry who might not be so receptive to you based on whatever your background is, that can give you pause. Do you wanna work with that person? And I think that's a challenge for this industry. And I can give you examples. Um, recently, I, there is somebody who is an African-American woman on Twitter. She's been invited to some financial conferences and she is not a paid speaker, but is a, an invited speaker. And she commented that she's overhearing too many negative comments right now as we're going through you know, Black Lives Matter and these protests. And she said, I'm not going to go next year. And I responded, you know, good for you for speaking up. And th I mean, it was quite a string of minority people in the financial services industry all speaking up. And 
one of my favorite um, financial, uh, personal financial columnists is Michelle Singletary from the Washington Post. And she also, she's an African-American woman, and she's also made comments in her columns along these lines. And we had a nice interchange, uh, email exchange on um, another issue on um, solo agers. And she actually published one of my comments in her column about that. So it's, it is an issue. And I, I think it goes to morality as well. Um, for example, if you look at the current occupant of the White House, I, I can say lying is wrong. <laughs> and you just do not want uh, to have financial advisors who maybe support somebody who is lying like crazy. And you wonder, hmm, true story. And we actually did a video on this that's posted on our YouTube channel. I had an African-American woman come into my office once. This was shortly after the election, if I, as I recall. And seven figures in investable assets, well off. And she asked me this probing question. She asked me, well, what do you think about Trump? And I know this is all a dangerous topic here, but I, I perceived the, this question immediately, that this was not a financial question, not, well, what do you think he's gonna do for the economy? What he's gonna do for the stock market? And it was kind of like, where do your sympathies lie? And I said, I'm appalled at a lot of what's happening, the racist birth or lie, all of those things. And I think that sends the message that, you know, we are not at cross purposes. And as a gay man, that's another issue. Uh, I was invited to speak um, this uh, January, back when we were traveling at Cetera's, um, we call it a fast forward conference. It's really a, a phenomenal conference that Cetera Advisors, my broker dealer, um, puts on and it's actually by advisors for advisors. It's not a, a huge conference. So we organize it, we participate in, and uh, the, it's for other advisors. And I was asked to be on a panel about niche marketing. I was with three others. And there was a woman who was talking about she was doing a niche with divorced women. So it's working with other women in a, going through a divorce. And there was um, a two gentlemen who were in Chicago working with union members. And these are often um, very totally in, in the trades, blue collar, plumbers, carpenters, and specializing in that market. And then I was asked to speak about the LGBT market. So I um, was you know, honored to do that. I've done it before. I actually spoke at the Financial Planning Association's national conference once on a little sub conference that they had called Pride Planners for the LGBT community and talked about LGBT financial planning. So part of my thinking about attending that and being on that panel was the issue of I know other advisors are saying, you know, oh, you know, I'd like to work with the LGBT community. What do I need to do? And so I'm trying to provide some insight. One of the things is if you are not part of a, any kind of a minority group, it can be hard to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. And it's often easy to think, and I, we see it right now, like, oh, this is exaggerated. People are complaining. They're, they're you know, quick to you know, do a, the, play the race card or something like that. I said at that conference, you know, to all these people, you know, don't, you know, you know, mimic or don't put down, a, you know, a pain you haven't endured if you've never, you know, lived through it. And I told one story, this was back 10 years ago. So it's, not, and we're not talking ancient history, but yeah, I've been with Luis, my now legal husband, for this year's our, um, our 35th anniversary. Man, I'm getting old. Um, but back in 2010, we were having same-sex marriage uh, as a topic, and it was not legal anywhere, and not at the state level, but you had had this massive campaign in all these states to pass constitutional amendments at the state level to ban it, and those were widely successful, and to kind of stir up the, the vote, the conservative vote. And here I was invited uh, by one of our major insurance companies, One America in Indianapolis, major company. They specialize in long-term care insurance and some of these interesting hybrid products that will be long-term care with life or annuities. Their name is on the, one of the skyscrapers in downtown Indianapolis. And I was invited, me and a family member, to attend their annual conference, which was in St. Thomas, the U.S. Virgin Islands. 
so it's flatters like and th that conference is actually yes there's the fun and the entertainment but they actually are some of it's really heavy duty financial planning sessions to learn about some of those those products in the best situations to use them and they even had a patent on one of them so as i go to register for this conference and i do luis and me he gets rejected i'm like what are you talking about he says no it has to be a family member and i'm like well we're a same-sex couple and we are actually scheduled to get married. We met in Washington, D.C. And we, Washington, D.C. was one of the first places to pass same-sex marriage, even though it had no federal recognition, no validity to us living in Miami. And, but we planned to go to Washington, D.C. to get married, which we did. We flew to Washington, got the um, permit, um, three-day waiting period, and um, we, we did actually get married. Well, I am lied to by this company. Just, I mean, incredible lies that, oh, we can't have same-sex people because we have all these tax issues and we have all these different companies and we have to have standard policies and the states have different you know, laws. And I'm like, well, okay, I can, I'll take this on. I will fight for this so that you get, you know, I took American Airlines policies about domestic partner benefits. And I said, I will, take this on and show you how you can change your rules, sample policies, we can discuss it at the conference. So I was really taken aback, but this is how naive I was, that this was sincere, that they said, we just can't have same-sex couples at these events. And so I said, well, my husband's a flight attendant. So if you're not gonna book him, I will I, use our passes. So we did not use their travel company at One America to go to the conference. We went together using his passes and then he stayed in the hotel room that they provided me as my guest. And so we went there together, but I was told he cannot attend any events, any functions, and there were some excursions and things. So I'm like, well, okay. The first night was a gala dinner and we were there outside that everybody's getting in, waiting to get seated and they're all just walking past us. And I know I created a stir because they knew he was there. And I was kind of expecting, you know, okay, well guys, since, since you're here, come on in. We were totally rejected. It was like, you do not attend this. You, this was not sit in the back of the bus. This was, you do not even get on the bus. And so we went to a restaurant there right next to their gala dinner we could see them and we had our own dinner and the next day i went to it that this was the full day of programming of uh all the financial planning material i go up to the person i was working with and i said you know i brought all of these sample policies domestic partner benefits so you can change your policy well then he explodes on me he says this is our policy and we're not going to change it and if you insist on pursuing this you're not going to be happy and my mouth fell open and I realized then this was discrimination, but it took all of that. This is how naive I was that it's, it turns out the head of the company at the time was on the national board of uh, a fundamentalist Christian organization. And this was company policy. And I, they read it to me over the phone, no same sex couples, but I said, well, can you give it to me in writing too? They refused to do that. So I <laughs> went and I do my fighting as you, many of you know, it's in my blood and I fight for my clients. I don't care if it's fighting banks, insurance companies, whatever I have to do, I am a fighter. So I went ahead and I wrote a letter to all of the, the, the leadership of that company. We had the contact information of all of the attendees. My assistant at the time, Marcella Sid, God bless you, Marcella, got all of this information and we just blasted it out. This happened to us, we were lied to. And I, I have this as a badge of honor. And then when I, I left the conference at that point, I said, okay, we're done, we're leaving. And the, we ended this, that we will discuss this after the conference, we'll have a phone call. And of course, then after the conference, I'm calling the company and they don't take my call. And so I'm like, okay, but I doesn't stop me. So I keep calling. So finally they set up in a, a meeting with one of their attorneys and somebody else I had been working with. And I have this letter, June 23rd, 2010. You lied to me in my face and you continue to run from me and delegated your dirty work to people below you. 
I was told months ago by Chris, I'll leave out his last name, that my same-sex spouse of 25 years back then, to, uh, to whom I am now legally married, is not considered a family member and could not attend this, this producer conference. I was told it had to do with tax reasons, maintaining a common policy across companies, dealing with field marketing organizations, which are basically like insurance brokerages, and they couldn't keep track of state law changes. This was all nonsense, but I naively believed it. Uh, well, I, I, I get on fire. And I said, this company's behavior toward me has been dishonest and unethical from the beginning up to now. I'm deeply disturbed by the lies for which there's no excuse especially from a financial services company entrusted with clients' money. My conversation with Chris and the attorney was damning. There was so much silence on their part. They were like deer caught in headlights. They couldn't say anything to defend themselves or the company. And I know other employees have been extremely embarrassed by all of this. And that phone call was a thing of beauty. I said, well, what about this? What about that? Silence. And it's just, we didn't lie to you. I'm like, yeah, you did. You lied to me. And they're like, oh, well, at any rate, my whole point in all this and going on is a lot of this has to do with integrity. I want you to, as clients, as the companies we're working with, I want you to have some trust, comfort level to know that we are honest, we have integrity. And I, I have so many more stories along those lines to share about the importance of diversity, that you're going to be respected. At that conference, uh, the Denver conference, where I was talking to Satir advisors about maybe how to work within the LGBT community, I know often people will say something like, and it's well, well meaning, I don't discriminate, I love everybody, I'm happy to work with anybody, I don't care if they're you know, African American, if they're Jewish, if they're LGBT, like, it's not enough. It's not enough just to say, I treat everybody the same. There are these issues. There are people who have been mistreated. There are financial planning issues for the lack of same-sex marriage rights, like people who had to take a pension as a single payout instead of a joint payout. How do you plan for a surviving spouse? I've had to deal with that several times. Um, the social security claiming strategies for um, couples. And maybe they took it when they, before that they would have now that they're legally married. So there's all sorts of issues. One of the biggest ones is just dignity. It is this person going to be treated and respected? I mean, if, are they going to be afraid to come out and talk about their family, about, talk if they're HIV positive? Um, you know, that's why there has to be this huge comfort level. And it's not enough just to say, I treat everybody the same. Make sure that there's visibility. And that, that's what we want. We want people who come to us to feel welcomed, um, not just we treat everybody the same. It's, um, and I, I'm going on, I want to you know, see if there are comments it, that I've got so much to say about this because our industry has a long way to go. Our conferences do tend to be overwhelmingly male, overwhelmingly white, uh, I think older, and that can, uh, can affect you know, the, the, the relationships, especially when you see you know, how people are voting you know, according to these, um, these polls. And one other thing I'm gonna say, clearly I am outspoken. I'm not shy about this at all. I don't think that's ever going to change. And I, I tell you that I encourage other people to speak up in the, our, like investment news, our trade journals, our publications. These questions are asked, like, well, how do you approach this with your clients? The, the overwhelming answer is from advisors, keep politics out of it. Just don't bring it up. Don't. Well, I think that's a little dismissive because it's not always just about politics. It's about character. It's about decency. So I do speak up and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to wrap up here. I tend to go on and I tell all these stories, but I have so much respect and admiration. I mean, it's I get emotional. I think about what African-American people have gone through in this country, particularly some older people. In Miami, I mean, I didn't realize this, restricted hotels, restricted, I mean, no Jewish people. And it's like, oh my God, I can't, I have so many Jewish clients. We have one client, Jewish man, older gay man, he passed away. And Luis and I went to Israel last year, great trip, Israel and Jordan. And we took his ashes, part of his ashes, and we scattered them at the Sea of Galilee. And 
I, I have the older gay man and Jewish. What we in our community have lived through from like here, coronavirus, people said we've never had a plague like this. And I'm thinking um, the AIDS epidemic, I remember that. And the reaction, political reactions like here, how could there be a political reaction to coronavirus? I mean, you know, AIDS, I mean, we were so attacked and um, oh, they deserve this and things like that. I'm gonna close with, on this issue of speaking up. And I, when we were in Israel, we went to the Holocaust Museum, Yad Vashem, and it's, it's, one, it's just so astounding. It wasn't that long ago, and you think, how could this have happened? One of my favorite memorials was actually to Raoul Wallenberg. And what I loved about this, I took a photo of it, and it has to do with a wording on something, and I'm going to share it with you, and it has to do with other people. And this was actually at the University of Michigan, a Raoul Wallenberg memorial. He went to the University of Michigan, as did I. And in that memorial there to him, it says, it's during the Holocaust, six million Jews, um, including half a million, one and a half million Jewish children were murdered in Nazi Germany's system of concentration camps, ghettos, murder squads, killing centers, and on and on. This is the key part. The horrifying success of the Nazi plan required the cooperation of hundreds of thousands of willing participants and the acquiescence or indifference of millions more. Pay attention to those words, cooperation, acquiescence, indifference. That is what we need to avoid. And it's like, it used to be somebody said a racist joke, okay, you don't have to laugh. Now we've been like, you speak up, you say, I think you can keep those comments to yourself. Try to have verbiage prepared if you need to. I've done that. Um, it continues, here we honor Raoul Wallenberg, a Swedish diplomat whose heroic actions to save tens of thousands of Hungarian Jews in 1944 are a contrast to the collaboration and silence which dominated Europe a contrast to the collaboration and silence. I thought about the times we are living in and when it's all over, I wanna look back and say, what did I do? And did I stand up? Did I do the right thing? Did I help people? And I, right now I can look back and say, I have a clean conscience and I will continue to do that. I wanna to go to my grave with a clean conscience on how I've treated people, how I've worked with people, how I've helped people, all the things we're doing. This is why I feel like I'm in my right livelihood in financial services, because gosh, we want to help people. Not that everything always goes perfectly, but we're gonna fight for people. And